Next, I want to invite to the stage our brother Timothy Brindle. Um, if you were here last night, you, you witnessed uh, a long set of hip hop and a particularly long song, a 10 minute song called Water Judgment, where he, uh, was, he was acting out his verses and even jumped from the stage. Does, did anyone see that? Uh, Timothy, would that be classified as rowdy? Okay, so that's, that's, that's considered rowdy. And we're, we're especially thankful for Tim's rowdiness. Um, I met Tim probably about a year after I got saved. I didn't know who he was. And he took a, we talked for about an hour. He was, at, he was doing a concert. He just, just took an interest in me. Uh, he, he was listening, which I don't do very well. I'm learning to do better. But he was just listening. He displayed the heart of humility. And our, our kids became pen pals. And, and he and I have been friends over the years. And um, he's personally my favorite uh, Christian hip-hop artist, really any hip-hop artist. Hopefully he's yours too now, after last night. Um, Tim is uh, married to Flo. Flo is from Angola. And they have uh, eight children on earth, one in heaven. And uh, they're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Tim is currently studying what feels to be like for the past decade at Westminster. And um, he is pursuing uh, church planting and missions with the potential emphasis going back to Angola um, to help enrich theologically and help raise up pastors who can uh, church plant in Angola. So Tim, would you come up here, brother? John, give it up for Tim. Judah. 
and encamp between Soko and Ezekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog, that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shalai as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought him to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. 
May the Lord bless the reading, hearing, and believing, and obeying of his word. Perhaps we have just read the most popular story in the Bible. Well known to us, well known to most of our children, and well known to the world. In fact, recently I was driving in West Philly and I stopped at a stoplight and turned and looked at the daycare center. And there were pictures of various child-friendly images and cartoons to make it look like an attractive place for parents to drop off their kids. So you had Dora the Explorer, real big in one window, Thomas the Train, Spider-Man, Mickey Mouse, and David and Goliath. <laughs> and at first, it's like, wow, that's kind of cool. I wonder if it's a Christian place. I found out it's not a Christian place. Like Noah's Ark and Daniel in the lion's den, the world has taken David and Goliath and made it sort of like a fable, sort of like a myth, like a cool story, like Jack and the Giant Slayer. A cool story we like to tell. Think about how, hey, we can be brave and beat our giants. I imagine that's not that different from the way you've heard David and Goliath preach or taught in a vacation Bible school or even in a children's book or children's Bible. Be like David, have faith in God and overcome your giants. So the primary way David and Goliath is usually applied is that David serves as an example for us that by faith in God, we too can overcome our unbeatable enemies if we emulate David. That's actually not a horrible application. There are some biblical truths in it. But brothers and sisters, I pray that as we dive into this text today, you'll see that this passage is actually a lot less about us and much more about the Son of David, Jesus Christ. Or another way to put it is that we can only rightly apply David and Goliath to our lives when we first see its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ who accomplishes the victory of salvation on our behalf and through our union with Christ we too can be like David and actually fight the battles of the Lord. Another thing to say by way of introduction is if we put ourselves in the story, we're actually much more like the trembling Israelites on the sidelines who have this unbeatable enemy or enemies who we cannot overcome on our own. And like the Israelites, we are in desperate need of the anointed king the shepherd king from the town of Bethlehem, from the tribe of Judah, to come on our behalf and overcome the enemy for us. In our own wisdom, in our own strength, in our own righteousness, we're unable to overcome our enemies of sin, death, Satan. And we're in desperate need of the king whom God has chosen which is our first point in the text. The king whom God has chosen. In order to best understand who David is as God's chosen king in 1 Samuel 17, we need to flip back to 1 Samuel 16. At this point in Israel's history, they've been settled in the land of promise for a few hundred years after the Lord rescued them from enslavement in Egypt. God's brought them into the land he promised them. Joshua and the leaders after him were fairly successful to execute God's judgment against the idolatrous people groups in the land. But they could not drive out the Philistines. Ah, those thorns in the Israelite side, the Philistines. In fact, from the beginning of 1 Samuel, Samuel the prophet has made clear, the reason why y'all cannot drive out the Philistines is because of your disobedience to the Lord, your idolatry, 
That's why the Philistines keep conquering you. So Israel has an idea. Well, we need a king. Enough of these judges. The judge's office isn't working, Samuel. Give us a king like the nations. Just like the pagan nations have kings, give us a king who can overcome these Philistines. Now that desire for a king in and of itself is not bad. In fact, we find in the very first chapters of the Bible, God the creator king made Adam in his image and gave him dominion, made him a king in his likeness. Adam, a prince, a vice king, a vice regent made in the image of God. And after Adam sinned, God picked back up with that program of kingship with Abraham. Through Abraham will come kings. And it's very clear that in Deuteronomy 17, God made known to the Israelites through Moses, guys, you're about to go into the land. Remember this standard of a king that God has laid out for you. When you go into the land, don't say, give us a nation, give us a king like the nations. This is the kind of king the Lord will give you. This is the kind of king God has chosen. I encourage you to read Deuteronomy 17 later. He will be a king that doesn't exalt himself above his brothers. Unfortunately, Saul's physical height, his physical appearance, is symbolic of his self-exaltation and his pride. God will choose a king that doesn't acquire help from the surrounding nations, but rather, Deuteronomy 17 says, God's king will have a heart that's set on the Lord in his word and his law. He will rule the people based on God's righteous standards. But the Israelites had forgotten Deuteronomy 17, and they actually did the exact opposite. They wanted a king like the nations. And Samuel warned them, are you sure you want a king like the nations who's going to exploit your sons and your daughters, who's going to oppress you and manipulate you and use you for his own selfish ends? Yes, give us a king like the nations. Okay, here you go, Saul. And the Israelites have now seen God's discipline in giving them Saul, the disobedient king. And so when we get to 1 Samuel 16, we see that God has rejected Saul from being king due to his disobedience. And therefore he asks Samuel the question, how long will you grieve over Saul? How long will you lament for the dead? That word is used elsewhere. In other words, as a king, Saul is like a dead man to me, Samuel. Rather, fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse from the town of Bethlehem. And that is the first thing to notice about the king whom God has chosen. He's from the town of Bethlehem. That's highlighted for an emphasis all throughout this story. In 1 Samuel 17, 12, it rehearses things from 1 Samuel 16. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. It's so important that just in case you missed it, the very last verse of 1 Samuel 17, as a way of summarizing the David and Goliath story, tells us in verse 58, David answers Saul, who am I? I'm the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. What's the big deal? He's from the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a town in Judah. In Judah is the tribe God had chosen to be the royal tribe. That promise of kingship that God said would come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob lines up his 12 sons and says, the promise of kingship is going to come through Judah, the scepter, the king's staff. The king's scepter will not depart from Judah. Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. Judah, the royal tribe. This is reminding us of God's faithfulness to his promise. And this is the king whom God has chosen. Notice that Samuel assumes the king God has chosen based on human appearance. 
But we see in 1 Samuel 16, verse 8, that Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. So this isn't the chosen one. Same as verse 9, when Shema passed before him. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Same as verse 10. The Lord has not chosen these, none of these guys. So well, then who is it? Who's left? There's one more. He's shepherding the sheep. He's the youngest, the smallest. He's the least likely. That's the other thing to notice about God's chosen king. He's a shepherd of the sheep. Now, if you've been reading through your Bible, you'll notice that shepherding is a royal activity. The Lord is my shepherd. But there are many godly shepherds at this point in the Old Testament. Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And David will compare his shepherding activity to the way that he rescues his sheep from beastly predators. And he compares that to what he will do with faith in the Lord against the beastly Goliath. This king is the anointed of the Lord. Verse 12 and 13. Notice, he sent and brought him in. Speaking of David. Now he, David, was running and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. This is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And as a result, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now this Hebrew verb, to anoint, the word mashak, it's the root for the word Mashiach, anointed one. And the transliteration of Mashiach is Messiah, the anointed one. That's why David's a unique figure at this point in redemptive history. He's the anointed of the Lord. And being anointed by God, it shows he's designated and being given power and being appointed by God for a special service. What are the other anointed offices? They are the mediator offices, the, the representative offices. There is the priests who are the anointed of the Lord at this point, the book of Numbers. Those are the only anointed, anointed ones before 1 Samuel. And the priests represent God's people in sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And they represent God's people before the Lord in worship. And of course, there's the prophet. The prophet represents God to the people and speaking the words of God. And Moses, the premier prophet, also intercedes for the people. And the king is the anointed of the Lord. Also, he represents God's righteous rule over the people. Israel needs a shepherd king to lead them in the paths of righteousness. But the king also represents God's people in war, in battle. He goes out on their behalf to fight their battles for them. And that's exactly what Goliath has called for. Choose a man for yourself. It's interesting this word for champion for Goliath. It means a single fighter. He's the representative fighter of the Philistines and he's saying, send me out your representative fighter. And who should come out to fight him? Saul. But Saul is filled with fear. He's trembling in his sandals, along with the other Israelites. But David is the anointed of the Lord. Notice that's connected to being empowered by the Spirit of the Lord, who rushes upon Daniel, uh, David in 1 Samuel 16, 13. He's empowered by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of God. In the following narrative, we won't have time for it, in verses 14 to the end, the first Samuel 16, shows the spirit of the Lord has been removed from Saul. Saul is no longer king in God's eyes. And the spirit of the Lord is with David as a worship leader and as a worshiper. And Saul hires out David to play his harp, his lyre before the Lord in worship. And that will cast out demons from Saul that are afflicting Saul. And brothers and sisters, this is a preview of what the spirit-anointed king is about to do. Cast out the demonic 
beastly giant, Goliath. And that's our second point, Goliath the serpent. See, in the scriptures, Goliath is depicted with beastly language. If David's the king chosen by God to represent his people in battle, Goliath is the satanic, beastly figure. Yeah, prove it to me, Tim. Show me. That sounds great, but show me from the text. Well, the first thing to notice is that Philist this Philistine Goliath, he's about nine feet tall. Going through first Samuel you know, recently, my wife mentioned, oh, I would not want to be his mother and give birth to him. <laughs> my wife has given birth to several children. I imagine Goliath's mom also was very big and therefore giving birth. She had particularly large body parts that enabled her to give birth to a baby giant, but that's not in the, the sermon notes, pardon me. But this giant should remind us of the theme of the giants in the Old Testament. If we remember, the giants first appear in Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God, likely the, the line of Seth, the chosen line that God's Savior would pass through, the line of Seth begins to mix with the daughters of men. That's likely the, the cursed line of Cain. God had made clear in Genesis 3, the offspring of the woman will have enmity and beef and war with the offspring of the serpent. So the cursed line of Cain laid out in Genesis 4 and the blessed line of Seth laid out in Genesis 5, culminating with Noah, they begin to mix. And what's the result? Boom, the Nephilim, the giants. This is in Genesis chapter 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Notice what the result of that is. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not contend with man forever, since he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. A prediction for when the flood will come to destroy man. 120 years. The Nephilim also translated the giants, were on the earth in those days. And also, after this. Not just before the flood, but after this. Why? Because the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they gave birth to them. These were the mighty men, or literally in the Hebrew, the strong men, who were from of old, the men of fame. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Although, Giants before the flood were destroyed. These guys pop up again after the flood. And where do we see the Nephilim again? Numbers 13. And the, the descendants of Anak. They are some of the Canaanites that are infesting the land of promise. Idolaters, idol worshippers, demon worshippers. They're the Canaanite people. Moses sends spies into the land of Canaan. Go check out the land. The spies come back and they're like, yeah, we saw the land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord said. But there are the giants, the Nephilim there. But we're like grasshoppers compared to them. It was only Caleb of the tribe of Judah. who said, come on, guys, we can take them. The Lord has given us the land. But unfortunately... Caleb from Judah is silenced by the fear of the spies, and therefore the Lord judges and disciplines the Israelites. It says, because of your unbelief, because of your fear, your 40 days of spying out the land, it's going to turn into 40 years in the wilderness. Notice that detail. For 40 days, Goliath in verse 16 of chapter 17, for 40 days the Philistine came forward back and forth, reminding them of this. Goliath represents the unbeatable enemies, the giants, and the people groups that the Israelites were unable to drive out. He is beastly in his appearance. There's several other ways that we see this beastly imagery. Notice in 1 Samuel 17, 5, in verse 6, he had a helmet of bronze. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. 
He had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze. In Hebrew, God uses repetition to teach us. Bronze, 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 four times in one sentence. Well, what's so significant about that? The root word of bronze, nakash, is the word for serpent. Hence the bronze serpents. The bronze serpent in Numbers 21. And King Nakash, same word in 1 Samuel 11, threatened to enslave the Israelites and pluck out their eyes. Here we have a worser version of King Nakash who threatens to enslave, bring into bondage to cause them to serve the Philistines. Same word used for the Egyptians enslaving the Israelites. So perhaps with this wordplay, it's reminding the people of the serpent. Now maybe you're not convinced. After all, Saul has a helmet of bronze, even though bronze is only measured one time for Saul, not four times in the same sentence. So what else is going on here? Well, the only other thing in verses 5 and 6 that's not made of bronze is what? Verse 5, Goliath's armor. ESV translation says a coat of mail. It's interesting. Saul's armor is also called a coat of mail. If you look carefully in the Hebrew, Saul's armor just has the word armor, shiryon. For Goliath, it's shiryon kaskasim, armor of scales, scaly armor. The NIV gets it right, scale armor. Well, okay, how else is scales used in the Bible? Well, first of all, nowhere else is scale armor found together. Well, how else is scales used? Deuteronomy 14.9, Leviticus 11.9, Ezekiel 29.4. Scales for sea monsters, reptiles. Pharaoh the dragon in Ezekiel 29 has scales. The inspired writer of Samuel, I'm convinced, is trying to get our attention. All right, he's a giant. That should remind you of something. Nakash, Nakash, Nakash. Serpent, serpent, serpent. Scales. Holy Spirit is moving the writer to remind us that Goliath embodies and represents it as a picture of the serpent, Satan himself. By the way, the reason our scripture reading was from Luke 11 is because what does Jesus call Satan? Strong man. It's the same word for Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 58. Jesus is likely referring to the Hebrew, Gibor, strong man. He knows the biblical theology of giants. He wrote the Bible. But how else is Goliath a serpent figure? Well, how else is he described in beastly imagery? Remember, the serpent was the craftiest of the beasts. He's the leader of the demonic beasts. And so the animal world serves in scripture as symbolism for the demonic beasts. David says in verse 36 that this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like a bear or a lion who I struck down. Perhaps not a coincidence that in the book of Daniel, a bear and a lion are two of the four demonic beasts. And that Satan is compared to a lion. He said to prowl about as a lion seeking to devour the people of God, 1 Peter 5.8. Ironically, Goliath compares himself to a dog. His first words to David in verse 43, am I a dog? David might be thinking, yes. <laughs> Jesus said to the Canaanite woman, it's not right to give bread to the dogs. Testing her faith. The point is this. Goliath and the uncircumcised Philistines, the unclean Philistines, are more like animals in their beastly idolatry. Although they're creating the image of God, that image is so shattered that having sex with animals and having sex with the same gender and sacrificing their children to demons and praying to demons 
in all of the wicked activity that Leviticus and Deuteronomy describes for these people groups, which is why God has sent the Israelites in to bring judgment on them. They're more like the serpent than they are the living God. And guess what? Goliath is about to become like his God, Dagon. Who is Goliath's God? Well, he has many gods. If the living God is not your God, you've got a lot of gods. But one of Goliath's gods is Dagon. And what happened to Dagon earlier in 1 Samuel, 7, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 5? Israelites think they can use the Ark of the Covenant as a good luck charm. They bring it into battle. Oh, I won't be manipulated, the Lord says. He allows the Philistines to kidnap the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, take on, here's our trophy of war. You defeated Yahweh. Here's the Ark of the Covenant at your feet, Dagon. They put it before the statue of Dagon in his temple. Fortunately, they come back the next day, and what's happened to Dagon? He's fallen down, and his head is rolled off. Fallen down, face first to the earth, and his head is rolled off. That's what's going to happen to Goliath. In fact, that same phrase, fallen down to the ground, face first, used for Goliath. It's used for Dagon. Why? Because we become like what we worship. Brothers and sisters, if you are feasting on idols, the, the enemy loves that. Yes, the Holy Spirit, he is working in his desire to make us into the, the transform us into the image of God, the image of Christ, but Satan, he's at work to try to make us like him. And if you're not in the Lord Jesus Christ today, the reason you have your beastly rage and your animalistic lust, just like animals, isn't that a song nowadays? A little out of it. It's because the enemy wants to make us like him. And David is, he reflects and images the living God, but Goliath images the serpent. He not only appears beastly in his appearance, serpent, reptile, bear, lion, dog, but he actually acts like the serpent. In verse 43, Goliath curses David by his gods. That word for declaring a curse means to accuse someone to be cursed. It's used later in 2 Samuel 15 for Shimei, who comes out of nowhere and begins to declare David a curse. You're a man of blood. This is after David has committed adultery and murder. And so Goliath, he acts like Satan. He's accusing and declaring a curse, David and the Israelites. This shows the spiritual war that is going on in the background. And he declares David and the Israelites to be a curse by his gods. But again, David in his faith is in the God of Israel. And so therefore he uses a bunch of language from Exodus. The battle is the Lord's. The Lord will give you into our hand. I come at you in the name of the Lord. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord, Israelites. The battle belongs to the Lord, as Moses would say. And what did the Lord do to the, to the Egyptians? He crushed their heads. The book of Exodus says, chapter 15, Psalm 74, and that's our final point. The crushing of the head. The crushing of the head. I like that. There's great head-crushing emphasis in the story. And the way that David kills Goliath, we see in verses 48 through 51, the emphasis on the shepherd weapon, the shepherd king. And it's, there's much vivid imagery. The stone that kills Goliath, it sinks into his forehead. No one in the world loves this story. And he falls down. And it's not enough for David to just crush his head. He has to cut off his head. It's almost as if he's killed twice. Well, can you think of any other places in Scripture where God makes mention of a serpent getting his head crushed? 
If you're familiar with the grand story of the Bible, you'll remember Genesis 3.15, that the offspring or the son of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. The very first telling of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, there's other head crushings throughout redemptive history in the Exodus. And then in the book of Judges, a couple of head crushings. This head crushing is reminding us of that promise, but brothers and sisters, in a vivid way, he gets 58 verses of description showing its importance. In a vivid way, it's pointing forward to it, shouting loudly about the son of David who will appear to destroy the works of the devil. David and Goliath is about Jesus Christ who has come to crush the head of the serpent. See, in ancient Near Eastern culture, to crush the head of an enemy means to deliver a lethal blow that renders the enemy powerless. The crushing of the head represents a decisive defeat and destruction of the enemy on behalf of the people of God. And this is what Jesus Christ has come to do. That is not what David did in 1 Samuel 17, ultimately. He crushed the head of one of the children of the devil. But we see later in 2 Samuel, David himself is overcome by the serpent in adultery and in murder and in numbering the people of God for his own pride. As it says in 2 Chronicles that Satan, 1 Chronicles rather, Satan comes to entice him. And David falls to the serpent. He could not overcome the serpent. Rather, the son of David, Jesus Christ, is the king who fights on our behalf to overcome an enemy much more powerful than the nine-foot giant. Jesus is the king from the town of Bethlehem whom God promised in Micah 5, 2, that a ruler and shepherd of his people would come from Bethlehem. He is the king of Judah who descended from David, the very first verse of the New Testament, son of David, son of Abraham, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate king chosen by Yahweh from before the foundation of the earth, he meets the requirements of Deuteronomy 17. He doesn't put himself above his brothers. He comes down and serves his brothers. He perfectly kept the law, and he did it on our behalf. He went out in his whole life and acted and worked on our behalf so that as the trembling soldiers of the Lord on the sidelines, our team captain goes out and kicks the winning goal for us, and we win because of him. God's king chosen, not based on man's standards, but based on God's standards. He is very unlikely according to human appearance. He's from the rugged town of Nazareth. The son of a carpenter had no outward appearance that we should desire him, Isaiah 53 says. Like David, despised by his brothers, hated by the false leaders of Israel, had a ragtag crew of disciples, as we'll see later in 1 Samuel, 7, uh, 1 Samuel with David. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate shepherd of the sheep. He rules as his king to protect Convergence Church from beastly predators. He himself becomes one of the sheep. He becomes a lamb. It is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The ultimate prophet, priest, king. Who represented us as our one mediator between God and man. And brothers and sisters, I'm convinced that when Jesus in Luke 11 calls Satan a strong man, He's referring back to David and Goliath because what else does he say? You have to bind the strong man and go in and strip him of his armor. That word for armor is the same word in the Greek Old Testament for when David put Goliath's armor in his tent. If Jesus sees David and Goliath as fulfilled in him, we should do the same. The Son of God has appeared to destroy the works of the devil. My five-year-old, Asaph, said, well, Dad, if Jesus has already crushed Satan's head, why is he still tempting me? Asaph, like, what a great question, son. 
That's why we allow our children to join us in worship. Dad, if Jesus crushed Satan's head, why is Satan roaming about seeking whom he'll devour? Great question, son. Son, 1 John 3, it says, the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil, to make powerless the works of the devil. And so even though the final head crushing has not come yet, Jesus Christ has not yet thrown the devil into the lake of fire, Asaph, he has already destroyed the works of the devil. Dad, what are the works of the devil? Well, what's Satan's name? Satan? Yes, that's a Hebrew word. What's Satan mean in the Hebrew? I don't know, Dad. You went, you've been in seminary longer than I've been alive. <laughs> Sorry, son. We'll, we'll be done with Westminster soon. Satan, Satan means accuser. Satan, like Goliath, but in a greater way, stands to accuse us before the living God. And guess right. Guess what, son? In most of his accusations, he's telling the truth. He knows God is a fair, just, righteous judge who must punish sin. And he, according to the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2, and Zechariah, uh, chapter 3, he is in the presence of God before the cross, accusing the people of God. Look at their sin. Aren't you holy? Aren't you just, Yahweh? You must exile them. You must banish them. You must destroy them. What's the lake of fire all about, God? Son, at the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ takes all our sin, all our guilt, all our shame. He puts it on himself, and he's accused in our place. And therefore, Revelation says the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. And therefore, we, his brothers, overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus poured out his blood on the cross because the blood of Christ is what forgives our sin, it atones for our sin, it turns away the wrath of God. He was accused in our place. But son, there's other works of the devil. He's a deceiver, he's a liar. Satan and his demonic hordes use the world to tempt and entice God's people. Temptation. And after tempting us to fall into sin, not only accusing us, he wants to make us in bondage to sin. And the scripture says the whole world lies in the hand of the evil one. If you're not in Christ, the scripture says your father is the devil and you're a slave to sin. Satan is your Lord. He's your master. Your will is to do your father the devil's will, Jesus says. But see, Jesus Christ at the cross he destroyed our old association with the enslaved order of Adam, our old self, our old enslaved to sin, Adamic self, has been crucified together with Christ and buried with him so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, Romans 6 says. Jesus Christ can no longer enslave you. Jesus, uh, the servant can no longer enslave us to sin. Now we're servants of Christ. Slaves of righteousness. The dragon of lust and sexual immorality. The beast of pride and rage. Anxiety and fear. Death itself. And fear of death. These things can no longer enslave us. Christ has destroyed the works of the devil. You still awake, Asaph? There's one more thing, son. <laughs> Hebrews 2 calls the devil he who has power over death. In Christ's resurrection, he removes the power of death as that which separates us from the living God forever by Jesus Christ destroying death for us in his resurrection. So son, can you see now, Jesus has destroyed Satan's head. He's crushed his head. He hasn't cut off his head yet. Two head crushings in one sense, we see in the text. He's, the serpent does not have his teeth. Jesus has 
shattered his teeth when he bites you. The venom of accusation, enslavement to sin, the power of death is gone. But we're still a part of the story. After David defeats Goliath, then what do the armies of Israel do? They follow David into battle. They strike down the Philistines. And it's very interesting that Goliath, as a strong man or mighty man, is compared in the Hebrew text to the mighty men, the strong men of David. And what do David's mighty men do? They slay giants. They slay lions. The pattern that King David sets, the pattern that the anointed shepherd king sets, is followed by his disciples. <laughs> So you do have to go out and face your giants, but you do so with the pattern of the son of David who is already destroyed the giant on your behalf. You go and fight the defeated enemy. Sin has been crucified. Put to death, scripture commands you, put to death the works of the flesh. Put to death the practices of the flesh. You put to death a crucified enemy. Does Christ do it, or do you do it? Yes! Christ did it, and now by the power of Christ, based on his victory, we're victorious. We still get to participate in this victory, to see that the battle belongs to the Lord. But the Goliath of the kingdom of darkness, Satan, he's already been destroyed, brothers and sisters. We need to read the text this way. We're called to advance the kingdom of Messiah by proclaiming the gospel as we pray King Jesus would set free souls from the bondage of Satan. And in our text, Jesus said, first you must bind the strong man. The book of Revelation says, Satan, the deceiver of this world, has been bound at the cross so that he can no longer deceive the nations. So Pastor Brian and Pastor Jade are convinced that the serpent can no longer enslave people in the plaza because the breaking forth of the kingdom of God has come in Christ's first coming. And now we are called to spread this kingdom, brothers and sisters. For this reason, on one way, we're also head crushers. This is what Paul says, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under y'all's feet. You're in the plural. The God of peace will soon, when he returns, crush Satan under your feet. As we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we bring the gospel to people in bondage and see people get set free, we're participating in the undoing of the kingdom of darkness. And guess what? On that day, when Christ returns and we stand before him clothed in his righteousness, we will sit with him in judgment. Why are you suing each other? Paul says it to the Corinthians. Are you not to judge angels? What angels? Satan and his demons? We're going to sit with Christ, Asaph. And then we will, with Christ, through our union with Christ, throw the devil into the lake. A fire, the final head crushing. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's pray. Oh Father, you have not left us without the shepherd king. You have not left us without the anointing of the Lord. You anointed him with the Spirit at his baptism. And then you anointed him in an even more glorious, mysterious way when he returned to your right hand at Pentecost and he poured out that anointing upon us. And therefore, John says, we have the anointing if we're in Christ. And so, Father, we're praying that the spirit of the anointed one would empower us to fight those giants that we're going to have to face today. Maybe in the next 15 minutes, Lord, empower us and enable us to continue to proclaim this gospel to our own souls, to our children, to our family members, to this neighborhood, to Charlotte, throughout the world, Father. 
that the victorious King, the Lord Jesus Christ, may get all the glory. We thank you for him and his victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Brother Brian. I just want to thank you, brother, for bringing me out. I meant to do that in the beginning. Um, I want to say something. I want to say